just uh, in closing, uh, I'll bring, give you something from the 50s uh, that takes us into the third part of my book, which is what it was like in the 50s. And I thought, as it for a change, I would read you uh, one of Don, my husband's stories that he wrote for the newspaper. And uh, Don and I, over the years, have always written stories for the newspaper on a historic vein. And I love this story because it's, uh, it's about our teenage life. Don, my husband and I started going steady in grade 10. And uh, then four years later, we married, and we've been married 62 years, almost 63. <laughs> so this is called Driving at the Bowl. And the Hollywood Bowl, the building's still there. It's right up on Carnarvon Street, down towards that end. And it was the swingin'est hot joint for teenagers <laughs> in the 50s. There has always been a generation gap between parents and kids, but that gap widened to a chasm in the early 1950s when a small army of local teenagers embraced the hoodlum look and turned the Hollywood Bowl dance hall on Carnarvon Street into the jumpingest jive joint this side of Seattle. The two key elements of the hoodlum look, the unofficial dress at the bowl, were trousers called strides, mm -hmm. wide at the knees, remember, mm -hmm. and a boogie haircut. Now strides typically were 25 inches or more wide at the knee, and only about 14 mm -hmm. inches at the cuff. <laughs> they couldn't be bought off the rack, but were tailor-made locally at Lee Brothers on Front Street. Usually or Glenn Chet, very, 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 very trendy. A boogie haircut was a crew cut on top and long on the side so it could be combed into a ducktail in the back with the help of a generous application of frill cream. Cream, a little dabble, do you? Everybody remembers that. Girls wore ponytails or poodle cuts, and a few wore strides, but most wore either full circle skirts with several crinolines or long pencil slim skirts that nearly touched their bobby socks and saddle shoes, angora or cashmere twin sets sweaters topped their outfits. While the Hollywood Bowl of the early 50s belonged to the teenagers, there was an older group in their early 20s who hung around too. They were always interested in the teenage girls, of course. Mm -hmm. One of them, Rusty Clancy, recalled Jack Ross, the policeman, who used, used to moonlight as a bouncer at the bowl. You get your hand stamped, so if you were old enough or looked old enough, you could step across the street into the Russell Hotel for a quick couple of beers for 10 cents a glass. That's really going back. There were two lines at the bowl, one sitting and one standing. The girls sat along the wall on one side, looking as demure as they could, considering they were being bounced up and down by the spring floor. Alf Tobin, the original bowl owner, told me that the spring floor cost a lot of money. This is how it's made. They laid two by fours on the cement floor. Then they got sacks and sacks of horse hair and laid it on top of the joists. Then the floorboards were laid on top of that thick layer of horse hair right <coughs> up to the wall which made for a very springy dance floor that didn't tire your legs. You could, you could dance all night and never get tired legs. The stag line at the bowl was the epitome of chauvinism and male bonding. Ed Harrington remembered, it took some of us all evening to get up nerve to ask a girl to dance. So when you finally did ask and she turned you down, 
it was devastating. <laughs> when that happened, to save face, we'd have a comeback like, well, I didn't really want to dance anyways. I just wanted to find out if he spoke English. <laughs> <laughs> Cheeky little teenagers. Eh? They haven't changed a bit, have they? When you did find a dance partner, slow dancing to moody ballad likes Blueberry Hill was in vogue, and sometimes they didn't relate and call it a moonlight waltz, no key waltz, of course. But when the jazz band struck up the heavy eight beat rhythm of a jump tune like Caravan, it was the signal for amateurs to clear the floor while the jivers took over. It was the dawn of the rock and roll era, a unique chemistry developed at the Hollywood Bowl when the beat of the Dixieland swing bands and the bounce of the spring floor inspired the jivers and they in turn inspired bands like Ross Williams and Nick Simcoe to new dimensions of musical expression. Word of the phenomena spread and by the early 50s, the bowl had become a mecca for hundreds of teenagers from across the lower mainland gravitated there every Friday and Saturday night. Because of its high profile, the Hollywood Bowl soon became a magnet for street gangs, like the local Edmund Street Gang and the Safferton Gang, and Vancouver's tough Eats Hastings Gang, and the very notorious Alma Dukes. Speaking of the Alma Dukes, they were these, these teenage gangs had rumbles, but nobody had weapons or anything like that. It was it was a, a lot of bluff and gusto and and a few bruised knuckles and that. But that that's about what it was. It wasn't like what we think of as gangs today. Okay, there were social groups basically with a lot of bravado. And I should tend to say when I was teaching high school. One spring we put on the musical Fiddler on the Roof and I was I played Yenta the matchmaker. And the fellow that we brought in, an older man that we brought in to play the role of Tevia was uh, Ross Laidley and uh, he and I became good friends during the, the production. And it turns out he was an, am, am, um, an Alma Duke when he was a teenager. That's the only Alma Duke I ever really met. <laughs> We were both in our 40s then. <coughs> Many teenagers came to New Westminster by car, and it became traditional for street rods and customized cars to cruise up and down Columbia Street on parade before the bowl opened in the evening. Hot rods were mostly 30s vintage uh, fenderless Ford coupes that had been chopped in height Customized cars were lowered in the back, then sprayed with gray primer paint after the chrome had been stripped and fender skirts added. And special mufflers gave them a, smart, a snarl and a rumble when the engine was revved. Ordinary family cars didn't really qualify to cruise Columbia Street in the 50s and didn't warrant a second glance, unless, of course, they were loaded with girls. That was allowed. The occasional late night revelries at, at closing these day, those days didn't compare to the near riots in the 50s when the Hollywood Bowl shut down for the night, particularly after the word flashed around that rival street gangs were going to rumble or a couple of renowned street fighters were going to duke it out. Retired Royal City cop Bill Morgan once told me that Alf Tobin and his bouncers ran a tight ship. The real problem was outside on the streets when the bowl emptied at the same time as the Army and Navy Club, the Premier Hotel, and the other nearby beer parlors. Tobin recalled Giggy Le Blonde from Royal Avenue. Giggy was a troublemaker at first. They called him Mr. Five by Five because he was five feet tall and nearly five feet wide. Every time he came to the bowl, his gang knew he'd help them out, 
so they'd start trouble and he was soon in the middle of it. One time he came to the dance and I wouldn't let him in. I told him, this is a dance hall and you don't dance. You only look for trouble. When you learn to dance, come back. He came back about a month later and he'd learned to dance and suddenly he was a good dancer, very light on his feet in spite of his girth. And when you got to know him, he was a very nice fellow. Elliot Basso Gray told me, the Hollywood Bowl was well run, but sometimes parents thought it, was a, it had a bad reputation. My girlfriend Lois and I weren't supposed to go there, so of course we went. That's when I met my husband, Wally Gray, from Annieville. When my mother asked how we met, I said, it was at bowling. <laughs> Actually, it was Hollywood bowling. <laughs> Elliot was one of my bridesmaids. After the bowl closed, we'd all drift down the hill for fish and chips at the Fraser Cafe, or Chinese food at the Pacific Cafe, known locally as Sloppy Joe's, or just hang out at the BC Electric Tram Depot at the foot of Bay Street. Those were re rebellious times and we were part of a social revolution. Before us teenage role models dressed pretty much like their parents, but to us, all parents were square. So for the first time in history, teenagers styled their own clothes, their own haircuts, their own cars, and their own music. <coughs> the Hollywood Bowl was cool, and for a short time, it belonged to us. The Hollywood Bowl peaked about 1953 when it was sold out every Friday and Saturday night. By the mid-late 50s, Alf Tobin was featuring bands with adult appeal and the bowl began to evolve to a dinner and dance spot later called Alfie's. If there was a spirit of the early 1950s in New Westminster, it hung out at the Hollywood Bowl, which echoed the music and emotions of our teenage years. At the time, we thought the beat and the bounce of the bowl would go on forever. We were young then. Mm -hmm. <laughs>